So I'm heading in to see Avatar The Way of Water, the first James Cameron film released in 13 years. The first James Cameron film released in the history of my YouTube channel. He's one of my absolute favorite directors, and I have been talking crap about the fact that he's only been making Avatar films for the last 25 years, the entire history of my channel. I am so ready for James Cameron to make a fool of me as I watch this movie. I hope I absolutely love it. I'm gonna go see it, and I'll let you know what I thought about it. My name is Sean and I love to talk about movies and TV way too much. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comments section. Let me know what did you think about Avatar The Way of Water and what were your expectations going into the movie? With that said, let's get started with the good. And we'll just cut right to the chase. James Cameron knows how to deliver big cinematic experiences. Movies worth seeing on the biggest screen possible with a packed crowd. This is a movie that absolutely justifies its budget. You know exactly where the money went and it delivers all the awe-inducing spectacle that you could want from a three hour long movie. That is James Cameron's gift and that is James Cameron's gift to us is that he can give you big, massive, incredible visuals, and that's what he does here. And along those same lines, he creates movies that take you on these big sweeping journeys where you feel tired and exhausted by the end of it because you felt so many emotions. You've been all along the way with these characters, and it, there's a sense of relief when the credits roll because it's like, ah, finally I can breathe after all the tension, all the conflict. He is a master at crafting tense blockbusters. And once again, he has done it here. And there's a bunch of different ingredients that kind of go into that with the Avatar films. And of course, with an Avatar film, the first ingredient that comes to mind are the visuals. The first Avatar was famous for just groundbreaking CGI and 3D. And that is the case here as well. In Austin, where I'm at, the press screens are almost never in 3D. I can't think of a, the last movie that was in 3D. They did this one in 3D. And of course, the visuals are simply astounding. And you forget just how immersive James Cameron makes his films when you see them on the big screen. Um, when, you know, I of course saw the first Avatar in the theaters, but that was 13 years ago. And so when you go back and just these massive images that are designed to be seen on massive scale, it's truly something astonishing to experience. And so much of what makes the movies just well, I kept just kept blowing my mind is that you know that such an extraordinary large percentage of what you're seeing is CGI, but you don't know where the line is. You can't tell the difference between what's real and what's not. It all feels consistent with everything else. And so the person that you're pretty sure that's a real human next to the big blue person, next to the alien fish thing, next to coral, you don't know where the line is between CGI and a person. And we see so many big gigantic spectacle films with so much CGI, and it's always so easy to tell where the line is. And you're watching this and you just buy into all of it. It all feels consistent with everything else that you're watching. And it's not just that it's believable and immersive. He does all these underwater shots where it's, it's just gorgeous stuff. It's interesting looking stuff. You're seeing things like you haven't seen before. Like it's a nature documentary while being an action movie for an environment that does not exist. Second ingredient of these Avatar films is the world building. James Cameron really wants you to, to buy into the world of Pandora. And so you just spend a lot of time learning about Pandora. And, you know, as the title says, they're learning about the way of water. In the previous film, they were forest people. Now they have to go out to the water. And so then that creates this whole new way in which the audience is learning more about this world as the characters learn more about another aspect of Pandora. But there's even things kind of going on with the military guys and what they're learning about the world of Pandora. And so you just feel like you're constantly discovering new things and learning about this place. 
that doesn't exist. And it's all part, you know, part of this world building and little elements that you learn about the world, of course, will tie back into the finale later on in the film. So it all matters. It's not just like random facts that we learned about a place that doesn't exist. Like, no, no, they matter for when these military guys make a choice, it has a consequence for what's gonna happen over here. Likewise, it has a negative and a positive consequence because it also involves the planet and what the planet's gonna wanna do and how our heroes can use something that we learned about earlier on as a mechanism to battle against the military. So it's just all really well thought out to make, like when you say well-crafted, or when I say that, I'm referring to when a movie feels like everything that you learn matters and ties back in. Everything that happens in the third act was set up earlier on. And there was a reason that it was set up earlier on. Like they explain it and you're like, you get why it's being said in that moment, but it also gives you information that you need for later on. It gives the character something later on that they need to overcome an obstacle. And James Cameron knows how to just craft movies where all the pieces fit together, everything matters, and it pays off when you get to the end of the film. Next ingredient here is a story designed to evoke emotions. Now, I was as critical of the first Avatar for sticking so close to a formula. It's the same structure as A Man Called Horse, Dances with Wolves, Fern Gully, Pocahontas, The Last Samurai. The idea of a broken soldier who's sent into a less advanced indigenous people to try and push them out of a land. He falls in love with their culture and ends up joining them to fight against the more advanced colonizing civilization. It's a story that's been told many, many times before, and Avatar stuck to the exact formula. And the reason it did that is that it is a very effective, potent formula that creates an underdog story where you understand what a group of people uh, value, you take it away from them, and so they fight back. And so the first a Avatar doesn't have the most original story, but you feel big emotions when that tree comes tumbling down. And with the second movie, I'm very happy to say that it doesn't stick to a formula. Uh, the story's still pretty straightforward. It's not like a complex story with a ton of different layers on top of each other. It's a straightforward story, but it's not a formula story. And they still find ways it's funny to say, but like you hate the humans by the time you get to the third act because they're acting so cruel and so callous in the choices that they're making. But one of the things that this movie does is that it expands the scope and size of kind of what's going on with the humans. It doesn't go too much into it. It kind of sets up a few details that are almost certainly going to be the plot of the rest of these movies. Just introduces some ideas that kind of elevate, like why are the humans behaving like this? Why do, like, are they so clueless as to other creatures that are intelligent? It does raise the stakes for the humans that would increase their motivation to find something at, like to mine this planet without concern for who it affects. But all that means that you feel big, big emotions as you go into the third act. The story here, once simple, it's fairly straightforward what our heroes are trying to do, what the villains are trying to do, and it sets up teases things for future movies. But it, it, what it means for this movie is the stakes are real personal with what's kind of going on here. And it's a movie that kind of ties into the Sully fam, Jake's family, and you get to go know his kids a lot. You spend a lot of time with them as they're learning about this world and they have their own struggles with kind of what's going on with them and being from Jake, who's kind of viewed as this outsider and the consequences of that. So you spend a lot of time with them, but it's also a movie that's, you feel everyone is in danger. So once again, there's stakes that are personal. That's the nature of this story. The scope and size, we're going all over this planet. Uh, it teases big things, but at its core, it's really a, this personal story about what's going on with a fairly small group of people with a battle that's on a very grand scale. And of course, the final ingredient here is that James Cameron delivers satisfying finales. As I just said, the first two thirds of the movie makes you so angry at these humans, the military and everything that they're doing and how hardened that they are, that you want the Navi to strike back and you get this big, gigantic, massive finale that's 
on top of water, it's underwater, it's on a ship, it's, it has all these different layers kind of going on to it. All of it's thrilling, it's exciting, it's visceral, it's interesting, it's unlike anything we've seen before. And like as I was watching it, I was thinking to myself, like, I, I liked Black Panther Wakanda Forever and I, I thought the, the third act was good enough. And the third act in this movie is in the same ballpark of you have advanced people on a ship, blue people in water. There's certain similarities between the third acts of these two movies. And the third act of Black Panther Wakanda Forever is just nothing compared to the third act of this movie. Of all the things going on, the visuals, the excitement, the scope, the size, and the way that this movie's able to make it just feel huge. Well, if you step back and think about it, they're not actually that different in size, but James Cameron is just a master of delivering huge, exciting, thrilling third acts that have emotion, that have costs, that have victories, that have people making personal choices, that pulls all the elements of the story that have been set up together all into a finale that just satisfies. When you put it all together, James Cameron makes movies that are events, that are worth seeing on a big screen. And it's not the same experience when you watch it at home. When you watch it on that massive screen with an audience and incredible sound, it takes you to a place and you have an actual experience that's different from what you can do at home. James Cameron makes movies to be seen in the theaters and I would recommend that you see this one on the biggest screen that you can find. Now the question is, is it better than the first Avatar? I'll let you know about that right before I give you my final score at the end of the video. But right now we're gonna move on to the mixed aspects of the film. And the big thing here is that I'm just not as interested in Pandora and the Na'vi as I am in the other worlds and mythologies that he's been a part of. And he absolutely pours his heart and soul into these Avatar films. And if anything, maybe he's poured more of himself into Pandora than anything else he's ever worked on. But, that doesn't mean that it's to my tastes. Um, to the question at the beginning of this of, man, did this movie convince me that James Cameron should have spent 30 years only making Avatar films? No, this movie absolutely did not convince me. Win me over to James Cameron making five Avatar films in a row. I don't know what he could do that would convince me of that, but this movie certainly did not do that. Is it a spectacle worth saying? Absolutely. Did I enjoy the film? Absolutely, I did but I still would have much preferred that James Cameron have chosen a different path for his career, but he's doing a good job with what he's doing in a world that I'm less excited about. Next couple of things I wanna talk about here aren't necessarily good or bad, just things that need to be talked about. First one, my pee break recommendation. This is the big question that people have been wondering. Someone asked James Cameron during one of the press junkets and he said, you can pee whenever you want because you can watch whatever you missed whenever you go see it a second time. I'll make a more specific recommendation. Just like in the first Avatar film, there's a montage in the middle of the movie where they're learning about a new aspect of the world of Pandora, specifically about the water. And so when they start learning the way of water, that's where you should probably go to the bathroom. There's absolutely some gorgeous images in here, but you know, whatever you would miss, you're gonna see those images or you'll pick up on whatever it was later on in the film. Next one is, should you see the movie in 3D? I'm probably not the best person to make a recommendation on this because I'm not a fan of 3D. I actually kind of like 3D as a gimmick more so than for actual purposes of trying to be immersive. Like the action sequences are more confusing to me when I have the 3D glasses on because there's just too much happening. So simply put, James Cameron is the absolute best at this. So if you like 3D, of course you should see it in 3D. If you're someone that's more skeptical, it's probably a movie that's worth, this is the movie worth experimenting with to give it a try. Like, I'm glad that I saw it in 3D. It's not like, oh man, I wish I hadn't seen it in 3D. I'm glad I did see it in 3D and it's, I'm glad it's the only movie I've seen in 3D in years. 
That's kind of the way I feel about it. That um, I don't know that that's my would be my preferred method going forward, but it's like a nice change of pace to have a different experience. And that's so much of what ties into my recommendation with this movie, that it really is an experience. Part of that experience is the 3D. So yeah, I, I, I would recommend checking it out as someone that's not really into 3D, but it's, it's the one time that you maybe make that change of pace to have this very different theatrical experience where the director crafted everything about the movie to be experienced that way. On this occasion, I do recommend it, especially because this is your opportunity to see that way. And after this, when you watch it at home, it's just not quite the same. From there, let's move on to the bad. And I'd say one of the trickiest things for this movie, one of the biggest things working against it are expectations. And when you have a director whose track record with sequels is Aliens and Terminator 2, his track record with his last two movies are back to back, highest grossing films of all time. And this is a sequel and sequel to the highest grossing film of all time, you can't possibly have higher expectations for the film. And it took 13 years for the movie to come out. Does it deliver on 13 years of expectation? Is it up there with Aliens and Terminator 2? Does it feel like this should be the highest grossing film of all time? No, no, it doesn't live up to those expectations. It's not that, but once again, the standard that I just gave you was Terminator, Terminator 2, two of my movies that are my top five of all time. So there's no reason to expect this movie to be in my top five movies of all time. So once again, expectations are the thing that kind of works against this movie to where you can put out a very good, a great film, and it can still feel a little bit disappointing when your standards are best of all time, highest grossing of all time, 13 years of anticipation it sets the bar really high, so it's very easy to be disappointed. Luckily for me, the original Avatar is my least favorite James Cameron film. Therefore, my expectations going in were probably just about right. I still think Avatar's a good film, but it's my least favorite of his films because I think he's a fantastic director. So what specifically didn't work great here? It starts off a little bit clunky. It has to kind of move a lot of parts around. It has to drop a lot of exposition to catch you up on what Jake has been up to with the Navi over the last decade. It has to do a little bit more work to set up our villains and what's kind of going on with the humans. So it's a little bit like a information dump for the first 45 minutes. And really the first hour of this movie feels like a prologue to the film as a whole. It's almost structured a little bit like three hour long episodes of a show because it's, it's like the setup episode, it's the development episode, and then it's the payoff episode. But it can be a little bit clunky when you're first getting acclimated to what exactly is going on with the film. Like it takes a good while before we even get to the water elements of the film because it just has to bridge the gap between the two films. Other thing in here is that uh, I felt like Jake and especially Nkiri got sidelined quite a bit in this film and their kids were put much more front and center. And even kind of what's kind of going on with Korich here, but like he even got more of a presence and an arc than, than Jake and Kiri. And I thought that's kind of odd. Um, and there, there's a bigger cast here, I think. There's kind of more characters because he does have a family. And so he's trying to balance all of that. And I, I felt like the balance was off. Maybe that's expectations and it'll play different when I rewatch it. And as a film that James Cameron said that he wanted to focus in on the characters, there's senses in which that's true, but then there's also a whole bunch of things that are set up, implied. You go a couple steps down a path, but felt really underdeveloped. And when you have a movie that's over three hours long, you shouldn't have underdeveloped elements. I, I get that you, there's four of these movies that are coming out in this decade. And so you have to have room for where everything else is gonna go. But um, 
you leave things unsatisfying when it's like, yeah, there's a connection here, but we're not gonna do enough with it. Right along these same lines, I felt that there was some small universe syndrome. And what I mean by that is when you create this big gigantic world, Pandora, but then you do a sequel where it still feels like we're dealing with the same exact characters. So two characters that died in the previous movie come back in this movie in some sense. They find some way that even though characters are dead, those are still just as prominent in this movie as they were in the last movie, if not more so prominent in this movie after their death. And they find ways to connect those characters even more so to characters going on here. So it, it like, as big as everything is, it feels super duper small as to who really matters in the scheme of everything going on. Does everyone have to be related to someone? Does everyone have to have a tie to like, what's kind of going on here? Like, really? And the final one on here is the movie doesn't come to the most satisfying resolution. If you don't want to hear anything remotely in the ballpark of spoilers, skip ahead about 30 seconds. I'm not going to go give any actual spoilers, but talking in general, you might be able to piece things together. But where the movie ends, you overcome the specific battle in the third act, but the conflict that led to the battle is it really resolved? The actual tension, the thing that led to that conflict, it still entirely exists. And so you get to the end of the movie and it's like, okay, we made it through the battle and then we got to the stopping point, but the, the story's not complete. The conflict's not resolved. It doesn't feel like the actual thing that we were working to overcome has been overcome. We just made it through the day. And once again, they're setting up three more of these sequels over the next few years. So a piece of that makes sense, but I don't feel like they found the most satisfying way to end this episode of Avatar. And I think going back to that language I used before, that's what a little bit like this feels like, that these are episodes. If this was the end of episode three of Avatar, I'm perfectly fine with it. But as it's the end of a movie, it feels like it probably needed more resolution Without that resolution, it just feels like a really epic setup movie. Real quick, before I give you my final thoughts, be sure to join me down below in the comment section. Let me know what did you think about Avatar The Way of Water. Also this weekend, I will be ranking all of James Cameron's films. This one was a fun one because he's one of my absolute favorite directors. And it was a little bit tricky because he hasn't released True Lies or The Abyss on Blu-ray, so I had to buy a French DVD of The Abyss in order to rewatch it for this ranking. So I'm really excited about this one. So as for the question, do I think Way of Water is better than the original Avatar? And I would say, yeah, I think it's a little bit better than the original Avatar because it doesn't stick so closely to a formula. It tells kind of its own story. It's still fairly straightforward and simple, but James Cameron is a master at telling these simple stories with big gigantic worlds that you want to explore that have incredible immersive visuals and very satisfying third act slam bang finales. Overall, it's an A minus on the entertainment scale, a nine out of 10, and this is a must see on the biggest screen that you can. Don't wait to stream it at home, watch it in the theater, actually experience a James Cameron film on the big screen. Come back this weekend for my ranking of all of his movies. Thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies too much. Bye.